When I first arrived in Australia, I heard of a case that everyone talked about. That case is called the engineer's case. In fact, some consider it to be the most significant case in Australia history. What is so special about it? Stay with me and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the engineer's case. Hello everyone, my name is Renato Costa, this is Aussie Law and today we're talking about the engineer's case. There's an American TV show called Suits. In that show, one of the characters, a lawyer called Harvey Specter, once said this, win a no-win situation by rewriting the rules. This is basically what happened in the engineer's case and I'll tell you why. The first step to understanding the engineer's case is understanding the composition of the High Court in 1920. In 1906, the number of seats at the High Court was increased from three to five. That was when two new justices, Isaac Isaacs and Henry Higgins, managed to get a seat at the High Court of Australia. They were both centralists and they both opposed viewing the Australian Constitution as a federal compound. They didn't care much about the federal structure and its influence in interpreting the Australian Constitution. What they wanted was a nationalist, a centralist Australia. This was already known since the times of the drafting of the Constitution, during the Constitutional Conventions, and it became even clearer in 1908 in the decision in R. and Barge, when both of the justices rejected the doctrine of reserved powers. I've talked about the doctrine of reserved powers in another video, the one entitled The Five Aspects of the Federal Constitution in Australia. Um, you can check that video by clicking on the top right corner. Later on, in 1912, Justice O'Connor had passed away and the High Court expanded again, now from five justices to seven. So by 1920, none of the justices that composed the first High Court were still sitting there. We had a completely different setup. We had Chief Justice Knox and Justices Higgins, Isaacs, Rich, Powers, Gavin Duffy and Stark. So this is the first thing that you should know about the engineer's case. This case was not decided by the same justices who had given us the doctrine of reserved powers and the principle of the implied immunities of intergovernmental instrumentalities. By the way, we need to remember these two principles as well. The doctrine of reserved powers guaranteed that the Commonwealth should not legislate outside of those limits the list of heads of powers in section 51 and 52 of the Australian Constitution. That is, there were certain legislative powers that were residual, that were reserved to the states. This is, in a nutshell, the doctrine of reserved powers. And the principle of implied immunities basically said that both the Commonwealth and the states could not legislate in a way that would interfere with the operation and government instrumentalities and functions of each other. So the Commonwealth cannot legislate about anything that would end up interfering in states' business. So these are the reasons why this decision is so paradigmatic. Because first of all, we have a new composition in the High Court and second, we have these two very important principles of constitutional interpretation. The way in which these two things come together in the engineer's case is exactly why this case is so important in the history of Australia. This was the opportunity for those who had lost the disputes during the drafting of the Constitution but were now sitting at the High Court to change the rules and change the way in which we interpret the Australian Constitution. So, let's dive into the cases, shall we? Let's start with the facts related to the engineer's case. It all began after the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, a trade union, started proceedings before the Commonwealth Court of Conciliation and Arbitration against 843 corporations. Among these corporations, there were employers like the Adelaide Steamship Company, which is a normal company, 
but there were also companies that were owned and regulated by one of the states. And three of them belonged and were related to Western Australia. So we have a trade union applying for the Commonwealth Arbitration Court because of an industrial dispute with some employers that among them we had some state instrumentalities. Corporations that were created, established and regulated by Western Australia. Now this court was established under section 5135 of the Australian Constitution which gave the federal parliament the possibility of um, dealing with matters related to industrial relations. But the dispute involved a state government instrumentality. Do you see what the problem is? Do you remember that we talked about a similar problem in a case called the Emden and PEDA? Well, under the doctrine of the implied intergovernmental immunities, those state instrumentalities would be immune from any action of the arbitration court. Since the court was created under section 51 of the Australian Constitution and was born out of the Commonwealth, then the Commonwealth could not use its own law to oblige or to bind a state instrumentality. The Commonwealth has no jurisdiction over certain areas which belong to the states. So far, what the principle and the idea of the implied immunity said was that the Commonwealth had no jurisdiction to interfere with state instrumentalities affairs. And that's why this whole setup was challenged before the High Court of Australia. So the High Court of Australia was invited to answer the following question. Does the federal parliament have the power under section 5135 to legislate in a way that binds certain state governmental instrumentalities in their capacities as employers? Think back to the doctrine of reserved powers and the implied immunities. Could the Commonwealth regulate labor relation in state government undertakings? This is the Gordian knot of the engineer's case. It was in this precise moment that the High Court reversed its previous understanding and changed the way they would interpret the Australian Constitution. Because here, they answered yes. By a majority of 5 to 1, with Gavin Duffy in dissent, the High Court not only rejected the doctrine of reserved powers and the implied immunities principle, it also established a new approach to interpreting the Australian Constitution, one that would not consider the federal compound anymore or the federal idea as its basis but one that would value the text of the Constitution, one that would read the Constitution by enlarging and expanding the powers of the Commonwealth. So the majority of the High Court did exactly what Harvey Specter suggested. They decided to rewrite the rules. The joint judgment was reputed to have been written by Justice Isaac Isaacs, and some constitutional scholars don't like that. For example, Jeffrey Sawyer and Leslie Zines have said that this judgment was one of the worst written and organized judgments in the history of Australia. And you can see other critiques to that judgment as well. Um, for example, there's a paper by Professor James Allen and Nicholas Aruni um, written for the Sydney Law Review that talks about it. Also, volume 31 of the Public Law Review dedicated a whole edition to analyzing the engineer's case after a hundred years of the decision. So if you have the opportunity, check out those articles. But you don't have to worry about Googling all of them. I have left the links to each one of those articles in the description of this video. You're welcome. Well, despite these criticisms, the engineer's case decision still stands today. So let's take a look at it and look at the decision properly speaking. The most important aspect of the engineer's case decision is in the new approach to interpreting the Australian Constitution. The engineer's court abolished any approach that would favor a federal interpretation of the Constitution. This was explicit in the majority judgment. There, Justice Isaac Isaac said that the Constitution 
was a political compact of the whole of the people of Australia. Do you see what he said there? The constitution, he said, is not to be read through the lens of federalism. It is not a federal compact, a political compact of the people of the states, but of the people of the whole of Australia. So the idea is, let's stop in thinking that there are certain principles that will pervade the interpretation of the constitution. Forget about the federal compact. The constitution is a document that was written by the whole of the people of Australia. So with that came the argument that the constitution was to be read literally. From the engineer's case onwards, the federal constitution was now to be interpreted as an act of the imperial parliament, as a written document, a legislation like any other, without any federal presuppositions around it. And to do that, the High Court was now to give full effect, full meaning to the plain language used in the text of the Constitution. The powers given by the Constitution to the Commonwealth were now to be interpreted with all the liberality that the text of the Constitution would admit. The interpretation of the Constitution now was to give the full and widest meaning to the text of the Constitution. So let me give you an example. Section 5135 of the Constitution was now to be given the widest possible literal meaning. And what was that? That meant that the Federal Commonwealth could have a court to resolve matters related to industrial relations even if in one of the sides of that dispute was a state instrumentality. The court was not concerned with the possibility of the Commonwealth enlarging its powers by the way in which the Constitution was being interpreted. If the text of the Constitution did not provide for limitations, that is, express the limitations, then it was as if there were no limitations at all. The majority opinion went on to say that, for example, paragraphs 31 and 34 had some expressed limitations to the powers um, under section 51 of the Constitution, to the Commonwealth powers. And that did not occur with section 5135. And therefore, without that express limit, there was no way in which the federal compound or the principles of federalism, or even this idea of reserved powers or implied immunities would operate. So the majority of the court held that the dispute between the Commonwealth and Western Australia was possible and that it fell under section 5135 of the Australian Constitution and was under one of the heads of powers of the Commonwealth. Look, there are certain things that will limit the powers of the Commonwealth nonetheless. For example, the list of powers, the list of heads of powers in section 51 of the Constitution. The Commonwealth cannot innovate and legislate about something that falls outside of that list, for example, and that is a proper limitation. And there are certain limitations that are within the text of the Constitution as well, like section 116 of the Constitution. Basically, what the High Court said was that there are no extrinsic limits, no extrinsic boundaries outside of the Constitution that can limit Commonwealth powers. Justice Higgins one of the justices in the majority, he actually said that. He said that the fundamental rule, the golden rule to interpret the Constitution was to give meaning to its language. And if the Constitution is a statute of the empire, then look at what he said in his own terms. Unless the limitation can be found elsewhere in the Constitution, it does not exist at all. So, of course, this sort of interpretation led to an incrementation of the powers of the Commonwealth. And I hope you can see that this goes contrary to the federal character of the Constitution. But still, in this decision, in the engineer's case, the High Court said that we are to interpret the Constitution not according to the federal compound, not according to the idea of federalism, but according to the text and the literal meaning of the words expressed in the Constitution. Let me just stress one point that I've said before. Some scholars say that it is hard not to picture Justice Isaacs having his revenge when he was writing the majority judgment in this case. Because this was his opportunity to revert 
the federal character of the Constitution, something that he was unable to do during the discussions for the drafting of the Constitution. It's Harvey Specter all over again. Well, having said that, let me now summarize the decision of the High Court in the engineer's case. The High Court held that, one, the Commonwealth Heads of Powers in Section 51 should be interpreted according to the natural and ordinary meaning and should not be limited extrinsically. Two, a limitation to those Commonwealth powers would only apply if by an implication from the text of the Constitution. And three, there is no such limitations as the implied immunities or the doctrine of reserved powers to the powers of the Commonwealth that are expressed in Section 51 of the Australian Constitution. So, since the engineers, when literalism is strictly applied, we can see that the Commonwealth will virtually be able to legislate about any subject. And it was precisely this extent that was challenged in another case called the Melbourne Corporation and the Commonwealth in 1947. This and some other cases try to contain a bit this expansion of the powers of the Commonwealth after the engineers case. If you want to learn more about those cases, I invite you to subscribe to my channel and also hit the bell sign because my next video will talk about the Melbourne Corporation Doctrine, something that is very intrinsically related to the engineer's case. You don't want to miss that. Well, this was everything that you needed to know about the engineer's case of 1920. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave a like to this video and I hope to see you next time. Until then, ciao!